Order, order. The committee is now in session. Uh, the committee throughout the pandemic for two months to capture evidence in real time during the course of the pandemic to be able to inform uh, whatever conclusions and reviews are subsequently undertaken. Uh, and secondly, and importantly, to draw out lessons during the pandemic uh, that may be relevant to decisions to be taken uh, to come during the course of the pandemic uh, itself. Uh, following uh, this week's session and next week's session, uh, we'll be making a report uh, of our lessons learned uh, to date. Um, we, we were going to have two sessions uh, today. Uh, the second session was with the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, uh, and his Permanent Secretary, uh, Sir Chris Wormald. Uh, we're very grateful uh, that Matt has agreed to appear before us next week because he has to make a statement uh, in the House of Commons uh, this afternoon, which would have limited the time uh, that he has with us. So we're very grateful for his flexibility uh, in that. Um, so I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, our, our witness uh, today, uh, familiar to uh, the committee, uh, the Government's Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Patrick Vallance. Um, I can, uh, should also welcome uh, that in addition to members of the Science and Technology Committee, we're very pleased to have Catherine McKinnell, uh, who is Chair of the House of Commons Petitions Committee, uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, Sir Patrick, uh, welcome and thank you for coming uh, before us today. Thank you. And I'm going to take this off because I can see that we're actually well separated here by two metres. We are indeed. In we, we, well have, uh, we have at least two metres between uh, us all and, uh, and probably uh, more. Uh, can I start, Patrick, by putting on record our appreciation uh, of your dedication and public service throughout the whole pandemic? Uh, you've appeared regularly before the, the committee uh, and you've engaged very constructively both in person and uh, through correspondence uh, with the committee. Uh, acting on uh, many of our suggestions and recommendations, such as the publication of the names of attendees at SAGE uh, and uh, of papers that SAGE uh, has considered. We're very grateful uh, uh, to you for that. Uh, and uh, perhaps through you, uh, we, the committee, can uh, put on record uh, our thanks and gratitude to, uh, to the scientific community uh, who have been uh, working tirelessly uh, and deploying their great expertise throughout this. We're very grateful. Well, that's much appreciated, and um, uh, I'm glad this in, uh, Select Committee is looking into this because it's important that we learn lessons as we go along. Absolutely. Um, so in that uh, spirit, and just to perhaps start with some, some general questions um, about the, the way that scientific advice is taken in the spirit of learning uh, as we go, um, we have, uh, as we, we know, some of the, the very best scientists in the world. Uh, you've invited uh, many of them to participate in SAGE discussions. Um, have you, have you find, found that they've been willing to accept? Have, you, have people responded to the, to the call? Uh, yes, everyone that we've invited to participate has accepted. And clearly we have different people at different meetings, so it's not a, a membership organisation. It's a, an organisation that invites people to join as we need them. Some have been at virtually every meeting, others have been at fewer. Um, but in general, and this has been my experience before this as well, when people are asked would they help uh, in a government emergency, uh, the answer is yes, and they turn up and they work um, extremely hard at it. And I would say that the people who've worked on this uh, epidemic um, uh, from various different universities have really worked incredibly hard on this. Um, and one of the questions, of course, is how we keep that sustainable for them as the new academic term starts as well. Indeed. So you've had the, the, the pick of uh, British science, which is, um, uh, which is one of the strongest forces uh, in the world. Um, when you last appeared before the committee, Patrick, you said that um, there were no significant instances uh, in which the government had chosen to go against SAGE's advice. You, you quite rightly made a distinction between policy decisions and the advice, uh, but you reflected and, uh, and the Chief Medical Officer did subsequently um, that there, uh, they could think of no significant uh, instances uh, in which the government uh, had Chosen to, chosen to go away from that advice. Uh, is, that, is that still true? Does that um, assessment still hold true? Are there any instances in which the government has gone against um, SAGE's advice? So you're absolutely right to draw the distinction that SAGE is an advisory body. 
And of course, the ultimate decisions are a mixture of policy and timing, which are not in our control. Those are things that, 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 that others have to make decisions around. Um, and in general, what I can be absolutely clear about is that those making policy and decisions have heard and understood the scientific advice. That I'm in no doubt about. Um, clearly, as the pandemic progresses and indeed as we get into release measures from lockdown, there are many other considerations that need to be taken into account as well as the science and therefore the ultimate policy position and decisions will need to weigh all sorts of different factors and therefore uh, difficult to say yes that's based entirely on science advice because it's not it's based on other things as well but we've given advice it's been heard it's been understood and it's been incorporated into decision, decision making and we'll come on to some of the other um, sources of policy uh, advice uh, but in terms of recommendations uh, of SAGE. Um, you know, last time earlier in the, in the year, uh, you, uh, you couldn't think of any significant uh, aspect in which the government had taken a different view from that recommended by SAGE. Is that still the case? Um, well, I, th I think it, it, it's absolutely the case that government has taken the advice and understood it. Um, um, and it's, it, I'm trying to think of an example to express why this is not a um, as you go into more complicated discussions, it's not a straightforward yes, no, in mm -hmm. the sense that what we're doing is laying out scientific reasons behind options from which people can choose. And overlaying that with economic and other considerations is the job of government. Um, clearly, if the government had done something which we said you should not do that, we would stand up and say you absolutely should not do that in our opinion from the science. And that is the that is part of the independence of SAGE? It's right? part of the independence and it's worth remembering that you know the, the membership of SAGE is a group of people who um, come largely from outside government who are independent and are not paid and are not contracted and therefore they give their views freely and, and frankly. So, uh, so reflecting as, uh, as science does and uh, you are personally one of the, uh, the most eminent scientists in the, in the country, You've, um, uh, you're a lifelong uh, scientist. Science is, is rigorous in confronting theory with evidence. Um, so if we look at the, the structure of the taking of scientific advice, uh, we've got one of the, the strongest science bases uh, in the world. People have been willing to, to serve. Um, the government has has explicitly said that it would follow and be guided by the advice. There hasn't been an occasion in which Sage has felt moved to, to speak out in public because the government was proceeding without that. Uh, so all of that would imply a very strong uh, system uh, for, for navigating through this pandemic. Uh, and yet the UK's response to the pandemic uh, is not the most admired in the world. I can put it um, that way. Uh, so, uh, in in your role, have you begun to think about what might be the the reasons for that? Yes, we think about that a lot, and uh, clearly there are um, things that we do as we go along to keep learning from what's going on, and we're in regular contact with many international partners. I think, as uh, Chris Whitty has said before, it's very difficult to know exactly where we stand at the moment. Um, it's clear that uh, the outcome has not been good in the UK. I think we can be absolutely clear about that. Um, it's also clear that you can see a band of um, countries that have done less well in the temperate zone, uh, countries that are very well connected internationally, uh, countries that have um, got population structures which are of a certain type. So there are many factors, I think, that are going to play in as we, as we look and say, well, what is it that makes mm -hmm. some countries uh, having done worse than others? And there will be things, decisions made that, that will turn out not to have been the right decisions at the time, I'm sure, about that as well. I mean, this is going to be a, a, a number of factors that need to be taken into account. Um, the other thing I would say is one lesson which I think is a very important one to learn from this uh, pandemic for emergencies in general is that data flows and data systems are incredibly important. You need the information in order to be able to make the decisions and therefore for any emergency situation those data systems need to be in place up front in order to be able to give the information to make the analysis and make the decisions. In order to gather data you need to have tests, yes. uh, do not, um, and therefore 
in terms of the, uh, the lack of testing capacity, we might come on to talk some more about that. It obviously has a, a medical dimension as to knowing who has the disease or not, but it has an information dimension as well to understand the spread and the patterns and the, who the virus affects and, uh, and how. And that, uh, is that the, the implication of that? Um, well, that's certainly one. It, it, it's absolutely the case, and I, I've said it before, that, that um, it would have been absolutely preferable to have had a much greater testing capacity early on. But it's not just testing. Um, it's basic information flows around patients in hospital, around um, rates of admission, rates of movement. Those sorts of things are important parts of this as well, and making sure all of those systems work. And going forward, it's going to be um, a number of things from local areas to make sure that we've got the right information flows to make decisions. Those are critical things to, to be able to get right in this. And uh, testing, you know, was a, uh, if you go back and look at the uh, minutes, was a preoccupation right at the beginning. We kept saying we need to get more testing capacity in place. We in being order to sage, get to sage, um, need to have more testing capacity in place. And of course, it's important to note that um, the capacity and capability of the public health system needs to be right in order to do this as well. Just in terms of those data flows, one might have expected, given that we have a national health service, um, that we would be advantaged uh, in this country in, in having data flow, uh, and yet you cite it as one of the reasons why um, our performance might not have been as good as it otherwise could be. Is, is that is that right? Have I? Well, I think I think we're in, the National Health Service does provide a fantastic opportunity to do this, and the data flows are really getting much much better now. But at the beginning, um, there were definitely times when we would have liked data that that was difficult to get, and and that's not surprising in a way because although it's a national health um, system, it doesn't have centralised data flows on everything you need, and, and and I doubt that's true in many other countries as well. So. Um, I think an improvement in data flows is a key part of, uh, of management of this and indeed other emergencies uh, as we look forward. Thank you. That's very helpful to, to know when it comes to, to making recommendations uh, for, the, uh, for the future. Uh, in terms of testing, we'll come on to, to this in more detail. Who, who's responsible for testing strategy? Uh, testing strategy is, is the responsibility of both uh, Public Health England and the Department of Health and um, uh, in terms of how the testing was used and what the priorities were, that was um, CMO who took accountability for organising that. And so when you said we, and you, which you clarified to be SAGE, um, had said consistently that we needed more <laughs> testing capacity, do you make, that, that is clear from uh, some of the minutes of SAGE meetings. Did you make that case explicitly to, uh, to Public Health England and the Department of Health? Well, Public Health England and, and, and DH are obviously um, both attendees um, and uh, observers at SAGE. So was, um, was SAGE sufficiently muscular, can I put it that way, in saying we need more testing capacity and it's not coming through quickly enough? Well, there, there you're, you're straying into um, operational and management matters. I mean, SAGE is an advisory body, and advisors can advise, and decisions need to be made as to what the outcomes are. And SAGE doesn't have a... It can't get into trying to manage things. It just doesn't have the right um, constituency. It doesn't have the right make-up or authority to do that. Could it not advise that we need to have more testing capacity based on looking at other countries around the world? And, it, and it did. And, and, and in fact, um, uh, you know, if I go back to papers from uh, the early February, um, for example, on um, contact uh, tracing and isolation um, paper, I think it was on the, uh, the 12th or the 24th of uh, February, uh, current PHE capacity to provide, it can be expected not to be sufficient or sustainable um, at the limits of controlling higher rates of incursions. We recommend that a practical, reasonable level of enhancement should be to enable a tenfold increase in capacity. So, I mean, there's clearly an undercapacity issue, which is well recognised, um, that, that's important to get right. And that's what's happening uh, now with the um, ramp up around Test and Trace and, and, the, and the JBC and other organisations. Thank you. Uh, just before I turn to, uh, to my colleagues, just to kind of explore some other reasons why uh, our performance at least provisionally, does not seem to be at the level of our international uh, reputation uh, in this area. So 
data flows you've mentioned, testing you've mentioned. Let me just explore another uh, possibility, which is that the scientific method um, relies on evidence, it prizes evidence, uh, as we know. But sometimes evidence takes some time to acquire, uh, and time can be lost uh, on the way to that. And might it be the case that some countries, and I'm thinking particularly in Europe, made policy decisions, uh, perhaps in advance of conclusive evidence in a, an academic paper, um, but actually uh, allowed, it, allowed these countries to act more quickly than a country which, depending on a very scientific approach, waited for the evidence. And there's one example I would give uh, of that, which was uh, something that was published um, just last week, which was the, the Vivaldi study um, of asymptomatic transmission in care homes. Uh, and the conclusion of the, the study, reported last week, uh, said that the study suggests that care home staff, uh, in care home staff, may be at increased risk of contracting the virus, which they may then pass on to others if they have no symptoms. And on the basis of that evidential conclusion, a change in policy was made last week, which was to have weekly testing uh, of all care home staff. Now, is it not the case that actually, without the study being completed, one could have had a, a pretty good intuition that transmission amongst care home staff, given that we know it could be transmitted asymptomatically, was likely to be important. And therefore, shouldn't we have acted, couldn't we have acted in anticipation of that, rather than waiting for this Vivaldi study uh, to report? Well, again, if you go back and look at the minutes, it's very clear that care homes were flagged up very early on. I think the first record I can find of care homes being flagged up was in February, um, and there were many after that as well. And uh, it was always the case that there was a worry about people moving between care homes, for example, as a way to spread infection. Um, what you are describing is the policy choices and how those policy choices are made. And I think um, that's not a decision for me, that's a decision for others as to when and how to make policy. But if we have a body, SAGE, uh, that is very eminent um, and the government has said that it will, you know, for very understandable and high-minded reasons, um, follow the science uh, and it waits for definitive conclusions, is that not paradoxically a potential source of disadvantage compared to a a country in which policymakers were able to make reasonable assessments of what seemed plausible and likely? Well, the two bits to the way you're framing the question, which is the assumption that somehow um, SAGE has policymakers in its grasp and policymakers will not move until SAGE does something, and that's not the method. Um, SAGE provides advice, and as I say, if you look at the care home advice, that went back right the way to February. Um, and that advice was always, because we're never dealing with certainty, we're not dealing with a body of evidence that mm -hmm. says it is absolutely the case, yes. that X or Y. We're dealing always with uncertainty, and it's in that uncertainty, and our job is to express that uncertainty to allow ministers and others to make decisions as to which policies they wish to follow. But and and I, I don't accept the premise that actually SAGE takes a position which says only when we're 100% certain do we go out and give a recommendation. You can see from the minutes that's not the case. We, we, we say there is uncertainty here, but within the bounds of this uncertainty, here is some advice. But do, was, did SAGE advise at an earlier stage that care home workers should be routinely tested? I can't remember exactly what we've, what we've recommended on individual uh, measures. I don't know when we recommended that. We certainly made advice around moving between care homes and other things uh, quite early on. Okay. Um, and uh, finally for me at this stage, we've, we've had SAGE and it's met very frequently. I think uh, weekly during the, the pandemic is, uh, is, is that the case. We've had a, uh, our bespoke system. If we hadn't have followed the approach that we had in terms of the structure of scientific advice, um, and if we had simply taken a decision to follow the World Health Organization's advice uh, at every point, um, then in February um, the uh, WHO advice was to, uh, to have a, uh, a mass regime of, uh, of testing, uh, looking at a release 
uh, statement in March to isolate, test and treat every case to break the chains of transmission. We'd have adopted a, a social distancing rule of one metre. We'd have indicated the use of face masks since the 6th of June. Is there any evidence that we would have fared worse if we'd followed current WHO advice rather than having our own bespoke system of advice? Um, well, clearly there's not, not evidence to suggest one way or the other, but I, I do want to pick up on a few things on that. I mean, there's obviously earlier things as well, such as those countries which uh, were affected by MERS back in 2015 or looked at MERS in 2015 took actions to get their public health systems and other things ready for this type of thing. So there were signals there that could have been looked at. Um, your face mask one is a very interesting one because if you go back, our advice on face masks was in April. And we said face masks are of marginal positive value when used in enclosed spaces where crowding may occur and you can't keep two metres distance, which essentially is the advice that WHO have come out with and is essentially the advice that now forms the basis of policy. So I don't think it's the case that... Um, we've deviated from WHO in terms of the advice and we were rather ahead of it in terms of that particular piece of advice. Um, and similarly on testing, it was clear very early on that we wanted testing ramped up. But again, I think there's a danger of confusing operational accountability with scientific advice. So in terms of the, uh, the face masks, um, obviously there's been the announcement that there to be mandatory within shops. Uh, are you saying that the SAGE advice was there in April and the policy decision has only just caught up with that advice? Well, the, the, the SAGE advice is there in the public domain to read and it says when face masks can be of value. Um, now, it's true that in, in, in April and during lockdown, of course, the value of the face mask is rather minimal because most people aren't going out. Mm -hmm. So it is sensible to think about timing, and this comes back to the point you raised earlier on yeah. about material differences between sage advice and actions. The timing is a different question. And timing um, now as we go into release of measures is a sensible time to start thinking about what, are, what other mitigating factors you, you want to put in place. And so, again, for example, making the workplace completely uh, COVID secure in the middle of lockdown would have made no difference because nobody was going into workplaces. It clearly is important now. So I think the timing one, again, is a policy question. Thank you. Now let me turn to my colleagues, uh, starting with Aaron Bell. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, Sir Patrick. Reiterate the, the thanks of the Chair to you, your colleagues, and the scientific community. If I could just briefly follow up on that face mask uh, point you were making. Uh, I think uh, we all re recall the Deputy Chief Medical Officer sitting down with the Prime Minister saying how face masks could be not beneficial, and this was before we went into lockdown. Was that based on sage advice as well, and, and therefore has the science changed? Um, I'm not sure the science has changed dramatically, actually. It, 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 there's sort of accumulating evidence. It's still not overwhelming evidence, and there are really three lines of evidence on face coverings. One is um, experimental mechanistic work. In other words, if I take this mask and start looking at droplets and so on, do droplets go through it? or how do droplets get distributed, or how does aerosol get distributed. Uh, and those studies all tend to show, yes, masks can stop things going through them. So they show a high level of protection. And then there's a second uh, level of advice, uh, evidence, which is around clinical trials, of what happens when people do or don't wear them. Um, and there the evidence is much weaker. In other words, you don't get 95% protection, as you might do if you tested that mechanistically you get some protection and it varies um, according to settings and then there's observational studies which we're now seeing which is what was the impact when masks were introduced in country A or country B or in environment A or B could you see a difference in the rates of infection they're quite difficult to interpret because usually um, the intervention isn't a single thing like a mask all sorts of things other things changed at the same time you put those uh, three air lines of evidence together and it reaches the conclusion that, that we did um, say I think it was back in April saying on balance masks have a positive effect 
um, in terms of stopping other people catching it from you, not from you catching it from other people, less evidence around that, and therefore in certain environments there's a role to wear it. I think maybe, and I, I, can't, I don't know exactly um, the context, but one of the things that the Deputy CMO may have been worried about, and it remains an issue, is if you wear masks for very prolonged periods, people tend to fiddle with them, fiddle with their face a lot, move them around, take them off and so on, and, and then, then it's, it's actually a, a bit more tricky to see, see what the benefit is. Thank you. And j just again on that, th there's been some suggestions that uh, one of the reasons that the Deputy CMO and, and presumably by extension SAGE were, were setting that position out in the first place was to discourage people from buying up all the supplies of face masks at the time. Would, is that not the case? I mean, it was purely a scientific decision rather than an operational one. Uh, well, uh, uh, again, I, I think it's quite important to recognise that SAGE doesn't give all of the scientific advice. SAGE is a group to give certain aspects of scientific advice sure. in certain settings. So not every utterance on science comes through SAGE or is approved by SAGE. And there's a whole system um, of public health and other things that make decisions based on science, which they've got all sorts of reasons to do. Um, I think it is the case that uh, there was a real concern, and I think the CMO was clear about this, that the situation in which um, um, medical grade masks are clearly of value and very important is in healthcare settings, and therefore there was a priority to make sure that those healthcare settings had those masks. I think that is clear. And so if I could turn now to um, immunity, going forward. What, what's the latest scientific evidence, what's the latest understanding uh, of, of SAGE on how long the immune response lasts and, and what are the implications for our future strategy? Yeah, um, well I, what's become much clearer over the course of this um, outbreak is that um, the vast majority of people who uh, get COVID get an antibody response. So in, for example, an outbreak setting, it looks like it's probably 95% of people get antibodies. There are papers suggesting a bit less, but it depends on the sensitivity of assays. But the vast majority of people get an antibody response. Um, it looks like most of those antibody responses uh, contain so-called neutralizing antibodies, so antibodies which would be expected to actually reduce the ability of the virus to cause an effect. Um, it also appears that um, in, in some cases, it's not clear what proportion, in some cases antibody levels seem to drop after about three months or so, or in the run-up to three months. So uh, antibody responses may not be long-lasting. Uh, that does not mean that some form of immunity is not long-lasting. So we've got other parts of the immune system. We may have memory cells on the B cell side of things. We may also have T cell responses, which are important, and we don't know. So there is much we still don't understand about immunity, um, and we don't know to what extent a positive antibody uh, means that you are protected against the virus or indeed protected against carriage of the virus. So we know more, but we lots of things we still don't understand about immunity. Um, I say we do know now that most people get an antibody response. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand back to the chair because I know we're short of time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think um, Andrew had a question on the structure of scientific advice. Is that right? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Sir Patrick. And you've been, and thank you, Chair, you've been at the central um, to a unique set of circumstances. Obviously, it, it is the first time we've dealt with this matter. Um, I just wondered yourself what lessons you have learned to date as you reflect about the next stage that we have to manage or indeed future pandemics. Well, um, lots of things, and we're, we're in the process of, of really taking a deep look to see you know, what, what are the things that we must concentrate on and get right. Um, things that I would reflect on Number one, as I say, in any emergency, and I think this is an important lesson across not just pandemics, but every emergency, data must have the data flows, must understand data ownership, must understand how data is going to get to the people for the information you require. So that's point number one. Um, the second is that um, when I look at the structure and the way that SAGE operates, it's never been set up to work for 47 meetings. Um, you know, we're meeting twice a week for most of this, and we need to think about how to make that work. It's largely um, 
volunteer academics who've helped out. Um, they've gone over and above to put their advice into the system and to help in all sorts of ways. I think we need to think about resilience of that system. The third point is that, uh, and it really speaks to the last question to some extent, um, the science system across government and across agencies needs to be robust. SAGE is not the science system, it is a science advisory body. And so science within Public Health England needs to be in the right place, science in departments needs to be in the right place. Um, there needs to be enough in order to be able to take the science advice or indeed other science advice to feed in. And the other um, thing which I think has been important, two other things maybe just to mention, one is that um, it's been really important that other bodies have stood up to be able to give science advice as well. So for example it's been incredibly helpful that the Royal Society has set up its groups to feed in. Uh, the report from the Academy of Medical Sciences that we commissioned on winter, very, very valuable. Royal Academy of Engineering have been fantastically helpful around um, aspects of engineering advice and so on, really useful. And then my final comment is, um, and it speaks to some extent to the point the, the, the Chairman was raising, on um, the docking mechanism of science into policy and operations. And I think it's really important that that works effectively. Traditionally for SAGE, that mechanism has been via the Civil Contingencies Secretariat and into COBRA, and obviously in a long-lasting um, uh, episode like this, other mechanisms have had to sort of be invented in order to make that happen, and I think that's a really crucial area. Thank you. I think we really, we look forward to hearing more about that another time. So I'll ask one more question and then we'll just move on. Is there any part of you as a champion and an esteemed scientist in your own right that makes you worried that science has perhaps been overweighted uh, in the conversations around how we as a, as a government and as a, as a parliament have managed this pandemic? And, and, and to cast a, a thought on that, do we, have we lacked for a business or an economic sage? Have you felt that, that science has one limb, has been strong and has, has had a strong voice at the table, uh, perhaps in the initial stages of managing the crisis, there are other constituencies that lacked for a similar structure? We, we thought hard about that actually and, and we thought about um, to what extent um, economics, for example, should be integrated into SAGE. It was quite a difficult thing to do, and, 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 and uh, Treasury, of course, has its very strong economic advice, and so that, that does come together through another route, and that gets integrated in um, Cabinet Office procedures in order to get those two things joined up. So I, I'm not in doubt there's been an extremely strong economic voice that's been heard throughout this, and um, a business voice as well, but I think as um, uh, both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have said, um, you don't get economic success unless you also get control of the epidemic. So there was a sort of, if you like, a first order thing, which is to get control of the epidemic. Just on that point, um, uh, Professor Mark Woolhouse uh, gave evidence to the committee. He's one of the, he's I think advised in, uh, on the modelling side, the epidemiological side of uh, SAGE. Um, and he told the committee, uh, I do think scientific advice is driven far too much by epidemiology, and I'm an epidemiologist. Uh, and what he said was, I was particularly concerned that we were looking at only one side of the equation when assessing the costs and benefits of lockdown. The other side is the harms done by lockdown. By those, I mean the harms uh, in terms of reduced access to healthcare provision, uh, harms to mental health, uh, and the impact on the economy. So would it not have been better to, and would it now be better, to have within that structure of scientific advice what Professor Woolhouse refers to as that side of the equation? Um, well, I think it was there, uh, um, and it wasn't only there in terms of some of the representation at SAGE. So we, we have a Treasury economist on SAGE, and um, we also have got several people who've got the background in that area. But it isn't the purpose of SAGE in this to, to look at that. But I, I will point to the, I think, very clear comments that the Chief Medical Officer has made about this. And I think he was very clear very early on, actually, that um, there were downsides to this from an economic perspective that would have significant health effects and he talked about the ways in which damage could occur as being direct from the virus, indirect from the virus because you've got overwhelming of the healthcare system which leads to problems 
indirect because of economic consequences of lockdown. And so there are ways in which this was really discussed very early on as a, as a risk, and we've been worried a lot about um, the consequence of this, and I think those worries are right. Now, you know, could, could, the, could the economic input be um, different? Could it be stronger? Could the science input merge with economic input in a more effective way? I mean, the answer's got to be yes. There must be some way in which you could look at that and make it better. So I'm not arguing that things are perfect, um, but I think it's incorrect to say that they weren't there at quite a prominent um, position, even quite early on. And so you made an assessment of the uh, the impact of the, the lockdown, the indirect impact uh, in terms of lives and health? Well, again, I, th- I think CMO is really being pretty clear about this, that, that the way that, that, that this should be looked at is overall excess deaths. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at overall excess deaths, then you're looking at the integrated effect of the virus itself with all the other reasons that people may have suffered as a result of this. And there's a lot of work going on on that, trying to get a good handle on that. It's not an easy thing to look at when you compare across countries because people measure these things differently. Um, um, But I think it is crucially important. And and we do need to understand the impact of that. And it's very clear that lockdown itself carries risks. And those risks are both physical health and mental health. And presumably they express themselves in terms of excess deaths, sometimes over the very long term. They may be very long term. And we've had groups looking at this um, uh, um, led from uh, both ONS and other parts of the SAGE group to say, what, how do we get our handle on the excess deaths and what the, what the origins of those are? Thank you. Uh, Dawn Butler um, and then Mark Logan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sir Patrick, for um, all of the work that you're doing. Um, the World Health Organization is rethinking how COVID-19 spreads in the air. Uh, 239 scientists from 32 countries Um, talk about floating virus particles that infect people who breathe them in. Do you agree with this science? Uh, We do, because we we said that in April. And one of the signatories to that letter is the chair of our environmental uh, modelling group, Kath Noakes. And um, if you look at the papers, we've argued from the beginning that there are three potential routes of transmission. Aerosol, which is the one that the WHO is talking about now, Um, droplets and uh, surface contact. Um, So I think it's clear that all those three are things that need to be taken into account. What we don't know, and interestingly we do not know this for flu yet either, is what the relative importance of the three different routes are. So that I think is the really crucial thing. Um, If it turns out that 90% is aerosol, which I think is unlikely, um, then that would would change things in terms of how you how you approach this. So it's the relative contribution rather than is any one of them important. We think all three are important, and the advice that we've given, with bounds of uncertainty, has been based on an assumption that all three routes can occur. The one that we don't think is is such a big uh, area, and the WHO doesn't either is um, a very widespread airborne transmission of the type you can get with with, um, measles and so on. We think that's less likely to be um, an important factor. Absolutely, because I understand that it can stay in the air for up to an hour. So just to ask you, if there was a queue of 300 people in a line, would you want to be at the front of the line or (laughs) the back of the line? Okay. Well, all sorts of questions there about, uh, about where you want to be in a line anyway. But um, I think if it's outdoors, the risk of transmission is low, and we see that. And we also see from some of the um, uh, um, demonstrations and so on that have taken place over the last um, couple of months that you don't act well so far. We haven't seen an uptick in cases as a result of that. So I'm not, I think outside the risk of, of transmission, particularly if you're keeping distancing distances, is pretty low. Um, inside, if you were in a big queue and um, uh, that queue wasn't distance, then it shouldn't be taking place. Thank you. And uh, sorry, to so for three, um, three actions, can you rate them for me? And I'm specifically referring to Parliament, actually, and how Parliament is currently voting. If you could advise the government, would you advise the government that uh, members of Parliament should vote online, uh, wear masks, or (laughs) 
stay in the line of 300 people whilst voting. How would you rate that advice to government? Well, I think uh, science advice here is not policy advice, and therefore my advice is, uh, as is laid out in our papers, that um, when you're indoors, if you cannot distance and you run a risk of being crowded, then you have to have other mitigating measures. And those mitigating measures can include ventilation, face covering wearings, hence I was wearing a face covering when I came in because I didn't know what the situation was when I walked into this room, hand hygiene, making sure that you are apart from people and ideally two metres apart still remains the optimum if you can do that. And so I think those are the sorts of measures that can be put in place in situations where you can't actually um, uh, avoid doing an activity. I think the policy on what you how you do that is, is not my decision. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mark Logan. Yeah, I understand that. I think the science advice is clear. Thank you, Chair. I had one. We'll come, we'll come back, uh, John. You'll have uh, another chance. Uh, uh, Mark Logan? Patrick, uh, just um, my thanks for everything you and the science community have been doing throughout the pandemic. And uh, I just have a few questions around face coverings or face masks. Um, just I'm interested the face covering you were wearing at the beginning of the session, what sort of special features does it have? Uh, well, it's a fa fairly standard cloth face covering. Uh, it's got a nose thing to make sure it doesn't slip off my nose and it's got um, several layers. How often did this one would you suggest, um, how, like, how long would you wear that for? Do you, do you wash it or is it just single usage? Oh, well, I think you should wear them for short periods. As I say, I don't think it's something you can wear all day in indoor environments. There's some evidence for that. And uh, yes, um, like my other clothes, I wash it. Okay, thank you. And then, is, is there a placebo effect or a psychological boost, do you think, from wearing a mask uh, that might positively impact immunity? Uh, well, I think it's, it, 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 I mean, it's a reminder. You can see from wearing a mask that people are taking, you know, when people are wearing a mask, it reminds you that there are things you need to do. So I think there are, you know, positive benefits to, to, to the messaging that might come with that sometimes. Then I'm interested to ask just that YouGov and Imperial College London had polling recently which showed that the uptake of wearing masks um, in the UK was much lower than, than a lot of countries that they uh, poll. And then I did my own polling on Facebook overnight where 470 people in Bolton, um, actually I found that 71% of people support wearing a face mask in shops, for example. So I mean, what do you think explains this kind of divergence between the actual practice of wearing masks in the UK and, and people's intentions? Uh, I'm not sure that I, I have a, a clear answer to that. I mean, I think there is something about messaging to make sure that people are aware what what the um, importance is and in which circumstances. I think it is important that people understand about the duration of wearing. It's very difficult to wear them all day, as I say, um, and, and therefore you need to think about how to manage that. Um, and I also think some of the you know polling on, on on what's happening in some of the countries doesn't quite seem to align with what you see. So, I mean, some of the figures suggested that 70% of the US was wearing them. I'm not sure that that quite fits with some of the pictures you see. So, I, I don't know whether we're, whether we're different in that. But you, you do hit on an important point, which is many of the responses to measures are quite culturally determined. And therefore, we need to make sure, not just as the UK as a whole, but in different communities in the UK, that both the messaging and the awareness of the cultural issues are taken into account in that messaging and the engagement. And, and just two final questions. One is roughly how many masks do you think that we'll, we will use now on a weekly or monthly basis given this new advice as, as a country? Uh, how many uh, do we need? To... I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have a figure for that. You think low millions, tens of millions? Well, I mean, it, 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 it's, going, it's likely to be many millions. Okay, great. And then finally, just on schools, it's, um, this morning I visited Eden Boys, Cannon Slade and uh, Valley Community Schools in Bolton. Um, the head teachers had some questions just specifically around um, can schools actually permit staff and pupils to wear face coverings if they wish to do so in some circumstances? And can they ask for face coverings to be worn? To be worn? Uh, 
Uh, I didn't catch the last part can, of the question. But, can, but, can they ask for them to be worn for prolonged periods? I think that was right, is it, Mark? Well, that's that, right. Yes, sir. I mean, it's, it's not really a science science question. I mean, it seems to me that that's a straight policy question and one for the schools. I mean, there's nothing um, there's nothing scientifically to say don't wear a face mask. There's lots of science that says there are certain situations in which it's beneficial. There is a problem, and and uh, it's an important one that that clearly it's not practical to ask small children to wear face masks and it's not sensible to do so and the evidence in terms of the role of children both in terms of their susceptibility and indeed potentially uh, their lower role in terms of transmission suggests that would not be a sensible route to go down for small uh, children. I think I just, sorry, sorry on that, the, the UK advice said aged 11 will know um, there isn't guidance to wear face masks, um, but I noticed, I think it was in Spain, they have the age limited around six years old. Is, is there any reason for that? Is there a risk for young, younger children to have a face covering on? They just don't tolerate it, but I think, again, it's quite, it's quite an important discussion in the sense that, that what we're straying into here, and this is where it's worth me just making a distinction, SAGE is not giving advice on detailed operational things. That will come straight out of DHSC and the uh, Chief Medical Officer's office and, 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 that's, and, and in many cases for businesses and so on, it will come out of bays and so on. Those are operational matters. Um, we haven't looked specifically at an age cut-off at which um, masks become um, use, you know, not, not, not usable in children. We haven't, we've said small children, it doesn't work for all the reasons you know, but we haven't given them a precise age cut-off. Thank you. Um, I, I think you did say, yes, Patrick, that prolonged use indoors was not recommended. Prolonged use indoors for, 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 for you know, routine workers is very difficult and, and, and that comes with all sorts of problems. Um, and I'm interested in what you said about not getting into the detailed advice, that's not for SAGE. So SAGE is taking, uh, as it were, a kind of broad uh, set of um, uh, advice on, on, on decisions. So when the Prime Minister asks for scientific advice on whether a cricket ball is a vector of disease, um, it doesn't come to SAGE, it comes to, it goes to somewhere else. Uh, well. I'll give you two examples. If you take the advice given on environment and, and COVID safe environments, yeah. we produced a number of papers which are in the public domain which gave a series of principles around that and how that could be applied. What we didn't do was go and say in this particular office configuration it needs to look like this. I mean that's obviously something that is a much more detailed operational matter inside a department or indeed inside a business and that's where the science advice in departments need to step in. Um, in terms of um, uh, cricket ball, no, cricket ball did not come to SAGE. Right, thank you. Uh, Graham Stream. Sir Patrick, as a, as a scientist, I was always taught, forget your hypotheses, forget your theories, your ideas, look at the data. And, you know, because having preconceived ideas can distort the way you, you look at things. When we went into this, uh, scientists in this country, this country were looking at data coming from China which showed a doubling of the infections every six or seven days. When you looked at our data closely, uh, the infections death rates were doubling every 30 hours to 36 hours. Why didn't you and SAGE advise the government uh, to change their attitude, because if, if you'd looked at that and given that advice, uh, the lockdown might have happened earlier. Okay, um, two, two things on that. The first is quite an important one as we look back and try and decide what should or shouldn't have happened, is we, we focus on lockdown, whereas actually there were a series of steps in the run-up to lockdown uh, which started with, um, well, actually started with with with, with um, isolation of people who come in from from other uh, from China. Um, but but the the main ones were case isolation, household isolation, then recommendations not to go to pubs and and theatres and so on. And if you look at what the behaviour change was, it was quite extreme over that period. So there's a, there's a number of things that happened. But your point about timing is absolutely right. And um, when the SAGE subgroup on modelling, SPI-M, saw that the 
doubling time had gone down to three days, which was in the middle of March. That's when the advice which SAGE issued was the remainder of the measures should be introduced as soon as possible. And that advice, I think, was given on the 18th of March or the 16th of March, I can't remember. But that's, but, and it's when those data became available. Now, looking back, you can see the data may have preceded that, but the data were not available before that. That knowledge of the three-day uh, doubling rate became evident during that week before. And did it immediately affect the recommendations on what to do? Uh, well, it, it absolutely affected the recommendations on what to do, which was to say um, the remaining measures should be implemented as soon as possible, I think was the advice that was given. You also uh, said at one stage, I think it was in, again in early March, that we didn't need to take such drastic action immediately. I'm paraphrasing it, that might not have been your exact phrase. Uh, because we were four weeks behind Italy. Again, it became, at that time, our deaths were quite low. Deaths uh, in Italy were at about 1,000. About 12 days later, we reached uh, that number of deaths. So it was clear then that we weren't 28 days behind uh, Italy. Uh, did you respond to that change in the data? And if so, how? Well, I think it's exactly the same timing. Uh, if, I mean, I haven't got the, the, the numbers, um, exact numbers you're talking about, but it, it's mid-March when it became obvious that this was accelerating faster and we were closer than, than it had seen. And at that moment was when the advice changed to say um, implement the measures as soon as possible. So the advice changed because we realised we were not four weeks behind Italy and the infection rate was about twice what we thought it was to start with. The advice changed because the doubling rate of the epidemic was seen to be down at three days instead of six or seven days. That, that's that what it was. was. I mean, we didn't explicitly say how many weeks we were behind Italy as a reason to change. It was the doubling time and the realisation that on the basis of the data, we were further ahead in the epidemic than had been thought by the modelling groups up until that time. That those figures indicate, which has always been stated by people, I guess, who couldn't define what exponential meant, uh, that uh, this disease was increasing exponentially. Uh, Michael Levitz, sort of uh, Nobel Prize winner, has recently done uh, some work which said that, which states that it's his conclusion that while the virus starts spreading exponentially it, it levels off and it follows, uh, I've written it down, the, the Gompertz curve, uh, which is a well-known biological uh, curve. A, are you aware of that work and has it informed any of the recommendations? Um, well, at the time, it, it didn't inform those recommendations because it was, it was exponential at the time. It was, it was doubling every three days. Yeah, at the start, uh, but I'm, I'm saying he's saying that... At some, point, at some point, it slows down. At some point, it yes. would slow down, that's yes. right. But, I mean, we didn't get anywhere close to that. Um, and so, no, is the answer. So, no, you weren't aware of the work, or no, you didn't take it into account? Well, no, we did not consider that... Um, we were anywhere close to this moving from an exponential to a non-exponential curve at that moment. Right. And the modellers, I mean, look at all of these things the whole time and give information on it. But, I mean, in order to do that, you need to be much higher up the epidemic curve before you start to level off. Um, we were nowhere near that. And can I just ask one... I know we should yeah. press for time. If I can just ask one uh, question related to your first answers to, to, to Greg... You said that uh, there was some information not available in the NHS, but you didn't give any examples of that, uh, uh, information that would have been useful had the information flows been there. Can, can you give us some examples? Yeah, I, th I think probably the, the best thing to do on that is, is that we get you um, something from the SPIM modelling group on, on the data flows that um, actually would have been helpful earlier on that, that took a while to get together and then we've got a record of, of, of those, those things and again that's absolutely not to say that, that people weren't trying very hard to do it but these things are difficult to get right and there were definitely some data flows that they would have liked to have seen earlier that they couldn't get.
Can you give us an example? Well, I'd rather I'd rather give you a written okay. uh, the detail because these are these are the detailed inputs to models, and so um, you know it is things like the the exact time bound. Um, admission rates, death rates, hospitalised, you know, ICU rates, and so on. Those things become really important to get accurately from all sources. Uh, information from care homes, those sorts of things, become important information flows to be able to get these models right. So rather than me give you a list now, I think we get um, the spy M to say, well, these are the things we would have liked to have had that we couldn't have at the right time. This is when we would have liked to have seen them. We'd be grateful for that, but in the next few days, if um, uh, we'll, we'll do that, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Carol Monaghan, and then Zara Sultan. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sir Patrick, for uh, the information you've given us so far. Um, can I ask, first of all, in the last 24 hours, we've heard that the Randox tests have been removed due to um, queries regarding safety standards. Are you able to tell us anything about that? No, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not part of um, uh, of what I look after. That's part, obviously, part of testing in DHSC. Okay. And um, so, have you any idea at all? And if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> um, removing these tests, how much big an impact that will have to the whole test and trace system? No, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't have that information. That's again one for DHSC and the testing okay. and tracing people. I'm sorry. Okay, um, so, well, a lot of my questions are about testing and tracing, but the, the next thing I'm wondering, and I, again, um, any information you can give us is useful. Um, hearing from people that are working in the, the tracing centres, many of them are struggling to get contacts to answer phones, possibly because it's coming up as a Whitfield number. Um, has, are you aware of that? And um, is there any moves to uh, allow the callers to see the number that's calling them? Again, the, these are operational matters for test and trace. They, they are not things that would come to me as chief scientist and not part of the SAGE area. And that's the responsibility, just to be clear, of Public Health England and the Department for Health and Social yes. Care. Yes. Um, and the Permanent Secretary and the Secretary of State will be appearing before us on Tuesday, so we'll be able to pursue that. Uh, sorry, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sir Patrick, SAGE advice states that at least 80% of contacts um, of a confirmed case need to self-isolate for the system to be effective. Now, currently, 77% um, of positive cases are identified and only 76 of their close contacts have been asked to self-isolate. So I would reckon that means we're only hitting about 50% of the contacts. So can this system currently be described as effective? Well, we, we um, put what we thought was a target that should be aimed for because we think that is a way in which you get control of this. And I would agree with what um, Dido Harding has said, which is the absolutely key thing is to get anyone who's got anything that they're worried about in terms of symptoms to get tested because increasing the number of people identified who are positive with symptoms will then allow the rest of the system of contact tracing to work as well. So I, I would really concentrate on getting um, the number of people tested um, with symptoms up, however mild those symptoms. And you can see why it's been difficult, because at the beginning the message was um, don't get tested because there wasn't testing capacity, just isolate yourself. And now the message is even if you've got something mild, go and get tested, and that's the important thing that we need to get across. Of course, one, one of the difficulties we have is a large proportion of people that, that, that are testing positive for COVID appear to show no symptoms at all. Is there any way our test and trace system can actually more proactively seek out positive cases rather than relying on those that are symptomatic yeah. to come forward? Yes, and, uh, and here we have given advice which is on testing um, high-risk uh, environments and high contact occupations as ways to do it. So we know that some occupations are much more likely um, to come into contact with lots of people. And uh, there's also evidence from the ONS survey that those um, uh, occupations end up with a higher risk. So there are occupations and there are environments. I mean, the obvious ones are 
uh, um, meat packing and so on where we know there's uh, um, an increased chance those are places to go and look for cases um, and then where you have an outbreak or where you see an increase in numbers in a city a region a locality that's also a time to go and test more in terms of asymptomatics do you, do you see that there would be a, a more proactive approach taken when schools return? Scottish schools are currently on summer holidays, they'll be returning mid-August. English schools will be returning hopefully to a more normal situation in September. Is there any plans in place to um, test staff that are working in the schools and frontline um, staff in, for example, care homes or in shops? Uh, well, again, um, you talk about testing policy here now. Um, I, I think the current situation is that testing is taking place in care homes, uh, both staff and, and um, patients, I think, once a week. Um, so I think that, that is happening. Um, what we are doing, what we've recommended and is underway in schools is a surveillance study in, to try and understand um, what the incidence and prevalence is in schools. So that will be going on, it is going on already to try and get um, measurements on that. Um, and uh, then there would need to be a, a policy in place around um, which makes sense on the basis of that survey in terms of testing. And I, I reiterate the point that, that the evidence around um, children in this disease are number one, they get. Um, a much, much milder disease, the evidence of severe disease, except in a small, very, very small minority, severe disease is extremely rare in children. Um, second is, there's some evidence that they may get infected less. Here the evidence is less strong, but I know the uh, report from the uh, um, President of the Royal College of Paediatricians and others, uh, and, and Ros Ego from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, suggests that overall children are at reduced risk of catching it. There's some controversy around that because the antibody tests don't always support that conclusion, but there's some evidence of reduced infection, and there's some evidence that they have reduced transmission as well. And when you look at countries where they've reopened schools, schools are very seldom the cause of the outbreak. Um, they're quite often the consequence. In other words, you get an outbreak in an area and a school gets infected, but schools don't seem to be a, a major cause of the outbreak wherever they've been looked at. Thank you. Can I come to Zara, Carol? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Carol. Zara Sultana. I've got a few questions, but just to start off, um, Sir Patrick, how would you define a second wave of COVID-19? Well, we're not, when, when people talk about second wave now, actually what I think they're talking about really is a re-emergence of the first wave. All we have done is suppress the first wave, and when you take the brakes off, you would expect it to come back. That is not the same as the classic wave people think of second wave, which is when the whole thing's gone away, down to low levels, it comes back again next year. And that's sort of the seasonal thing that's been seen um, with pandemic flu, for example, in, in 1918. Um, and we don't yet know whether this is a seasonal virus, but there are some, I think, pretty strong hints it's, it may well be. Uh, and so a second wave is more like this thing going around the world and coming back again. What we're dealing with now is a suppressed first wave, I think. And what is the likelihood that the UK will experience a second wave? And what would you recommend the single most important thing being to avoid that situation? Well, I think the, the, there's a, a very high likelihood um, that come winter, we will see an increase in cases. And I think that was um, described very effectively in the Academy of Medical Sciences report, which we commissioned. Um, I think that's likely that's that's you could argue that's the tail end of the first wave, still, still there being uh, coming back. Um, and I think it's quite probable that we will see this virus coming back in different waves over a number of years. UCL and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine researchers argue that fully reopening schools in September and parents returning to work without an effective test and trace programme could trigger a second wave. 
do you personally agree with these findings and do you think schools are adequately prepared in terms of contingency planning for a second wave or even localised lockdowns? Well, I, I don't, again, depending on the definition of second wave, I don't think schools are going to trigger a second wave, they, they, uh, um, but any measures that you release could allow a recur recurrence of the first wave, as it were. Um, I think everyone, including um, the representative of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine on SAGE and the modellers from there, uh, believe that schools are relatively lower risk than other things in terms of opening. Uh, one of the important areas that we need to look at is to make sure there's enough room for schools to open because we absolutely know that, that um, uh, there are risks to keeping schools shut. So um, I think SAGE, the modellers and... Um, uh, the consideration from the subgroup that we've got working on schools is very clear that um, we think that reopening schools is a priority. Um, it's important for children. Um, the president of the Royal College of Paediatricians, again, Russell Viner, has been clear that there are un unwanted health and both mental and physical health problems with keeping schools shut. And schools, for the reasons I've said, children are at lower risk and actually teachers um, are more likely to be at risk from um, other adults and sitting in um, small coffee rooms and so on with other, uh, other adults than they are from the children themselves. Thank you. I'm just going to ask some questions just about um, the app. So in a committee session that we had on the 24th of April, Professor Whitty said that contact tracing done the old-fashioned way, i.e. not using an app that takes a, a lot of the heavy lifting, is unbelievably uh, labour-intensive to do. Do you agree, and how can a, a test and trace system effectively work without an app? Uh, well, contact tracing is very labour-intensive, and it exactly goes back to the point I made earlier on, that the... Um, uh, test and trace system, which or the tracing system that was in place actually in February, um, was not one that we didn't like. We wanted more of it, but it was very difficult to scale that on the basis of what Public Health England was able to do at the time. Um, the app can help. I think an, a well-designed app that works, you could imagine, could help. Just worth reflecting, though, that um, the... Uh, modelling that's been done suggests that if 30% of people were using it, you'd roughly have a 9% increase detection rate. So, you know, you've got to get very high levels of use in order to get um, significant effects, which is obvious, because what you're trying to do is to pick up those contacts which you wouldn't pick up from memory, but you'd pick up because your phone or whatever told you you were close to somebody. So I think there is an absolutely... A, a role here, provided this can be done properly, and it hasn't been easy anywhere. I mean, the idea that lots of people have got great apps working on this is is not correct. I mean, they've got some aspects of great apps working. That's my final question. Um, the NHS has spent eleven point eight million pounds de um, developing and testing the NHS X app. It's faced technical problems, severe delays, and was eventually abandoned. We've also seen thirty-two million handed to a pest control company to source surgical gowns, and sixteen million in April to um, get antibody tests from China that were shelved because they didn't work accurately. I appreciate this isn't a scientific question, but do you share my concerns on how public funds have been used during this pandemic? That sounds like a question for the Secretary of State for Which, DHSC to me. Fortunately, he's coming on, uh, on Tuesday, so I'm sure Zara will uh, ask that. Um, uh, Spatrick, do you think people should no longer work from home uh, if they're not vulnerable or living with vulnerable people? Uh, I think my view on this, and I think this is a view shared by SAGE, is that we're still um, at a time when distancing measures are important, and of the various distancing measures uh, working from home for many companies remains a perfectly good option because um, it's easy to do. I think a number of companies think it's actually um, not detrimental to productivity um, and in that situation absolutely no reason I can see to change it. We have discussed the importance of the, uh, the indirect effects through the economy um, yes. um, and uh, the, the Governor of the Bank of England uh, is reported to be concerned about people working from home. Companies may be able to manage with it, but uh, if their workers are at home, they're not in shops and cafes and um, using public yeah. transport. Uh, has that proved, has that been part of your assessment? In uh, well, uh, 
we haven't been asked specifically to look at that question, but it clearly is part of the assessment, and that's where the integration of the economic, business, and, and, and uh, science comes together, and I've certainly been involved in those discussions. It's urgently needed, isn't it, that assessment? Sorry? It's urgently needed, that assessment. That is exactly what's going on in Cabinet Office with Treasury, and, and those things are fed into the decision-making process. Right. So outside SAGE... That's not as... I mean, SAGE can't advise on that. So, so SAGE's advice would be on... on I mean, the principle is in a way quite easy, which is, which is um, the likelihood of the spread of the virus is dependent on contacts. Mm -hmm. So the more contacts you have at close range, the more likely this is to spread. And that principle under, underpins a lot of the advice. And then clearly, the decision, for all the reasons we've talked about, including the economic impact of this and the impact of that on health, need to be integrated in terms of final policy decisions. But that assessment the economic impact is relevant to lives and Correct. and health. So is it right that that should not be part of SAGE, that SAGE should just look, as it were, at the transmission and not at the health consequences of some of the, uh, the measures? So we do look, as I said, and, and again, I'll go back to uh, CMO, I think has been absolutely clear about this from very early on, the health impact of lockdown and measures we consider, but not in a modelling sense. We're not modelling that. We can't because we don't have the economic modelling. But that is done, and that is then integrated at um, a Cabinet Office level in terms of the people around the table, which usually, or always, includes either CMO, me, or both of us, or other scientific, scientific representatives to make sure the, the epide epidemiology on the other side of it is properly understood in relation to the business and economic decisions that need to be made. I see. Thank you. But I think it would be wrong to think that that's a a way that SAGE should do that. I mean, I think it's going to become a very big distraction to what SAGE needs to concentrate on. Well, as long as someone's doing it. Yeah, it is being done. Yeah. Um, Catherine McKinnon. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, sorry, I've just come back on. I've totally lost all connection, so thank you. I'm really sorry that I've just missed the bit just before you go back here. To you, so Catherine. If, I, if I repeat something somebody said, I apologise. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. There are a, a huge number of petitioners interested and concerned um, in this issue. So it, it's good to be here in that capacity to represent some of their concerns. Um, I wanted to um, follow up on some of the questions that Zara was asking about the uh, track and trace system. And um, I'm really sorry, though, that I missed the answer that you will have just have given about uh, the app and taking some of the heavy lifting out of the old-fashioned way as Professor Witty described it. Um, and I wanted to um, uh, explore how, in the absence of an app, we maximise our ability to track and trace, because it clearly is um, the most, one of the most important things we can do to get ahead of the virus now. Um, and so it would be helpful to understand um, from you um, what, 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 what level of data we, we need to have available to the local public health. And I know this is a responsibility of um, Public Health England, but just in terms of the data, if you could explain um, how we ensure that the track and trace system is as effective as possible in the absence of a NAP that would be doing some of that work for us. So two, two different questions in there. I, I, I'll just repeat what I said about the app. I think the app is an important potential part of this, but it's worth remembering if you had 30% of us all using it, you'd increase the number by about 9%. So we shouldn't think of the app as the answer to the problem. I'm afraid there's some rather boring, old-fashioned... Um, boots on the ground type thing that needs to happen in contact tracing which is what's happening now and the app would be a supplement to that and a useful one were it able to um, uh, uh, be fully functional and it's not easy to get these things fully functional anywhere in the world. So that's that's the um, uh, first point about that. Sorry, I've slightly forgotten the other part of the question now. Um, no, so the, so, the, so the question is... In the, in, oh, the, in, the data flow, in sorry. Order yeah. to, in, in order to maximise yeah. those boots on the ground, so to speak, yeah. As you said, it was very effective when the local public health teams yep. were able to do what they do, and they do it very effectively in um, tracking down public health issues. And they were doing that in relation to coronavirus. And obviously, it then became a much larger 
and it needed to be scaled up, which is why then it became a national, um, a national effort. And there's now 18,000 track and traces. The problem seems to be, and this seems to be coming from a number of um, directors of public health, that the two don't seem to be working together necessarily. And so you're not getting the adding up together of national um, ability to track and trace with local intelligence that's really vital for understanding how best to tackle it in local areas. So I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, I strongly agree that this is a very important thing to get right locally and the information flows need to be right. And the new Joint Biosecurity Centre is set up precisely to try and make sure that the data flows are there and they work and they get out into where they need to be, which is the local areas. And you're quite right that the local public health teams and local public health directors are absolutely critical in this because you know we've moved from a stage of thinking a blunt lockdown across the whole population to being able to release some of those and then rely on much more local action. And local action can be as local as this one building needs to be looked at. Yeah. That requires really yeah. good information flows and it requires Public Health England on the ground and it requires JBC to be linked to that. And I know that's what people are working on and those are very key operational matters to get right. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, when, and we're not there yet and I think one of the challenges is that the level of data that's being provided is at postcode level. I think that's as granular as it gets. But, but even if you live at the same postcode, you don't necessarily attend the same church, you won't have been to the same swimming pool, um, you won't go to the same pub. And, and so the ability to actually get ahead of this virus does seem to be hampered by the data at the moment. I, I agree, and it's the, it's the granularity of that data and things like you know where you live isn't necessarily where you work. And those sorts of bits of information yeah. are really important. Thank you. Um, and, we the, to... and the speed as well. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, uh, Graham Stringer, and then Aaron Bell, and then Catherine Fletcher. Um, thank you. Can, can I just? Uh, I've got some questions on testing. Can I just ask a couple of questions on your previous answers? Right at the beginning, you talked about the problems in in care homes. Was it? And, and that that was discussed at SAGE. Uh, we were told right at the start of this epidemic that if this bug got into care homes, you, we were likely to get 30 40% deaths in, in, in the care homes based on evidence from Washington State uh, in America. Uh, did you do a risk analysis? Most of the reasons given for not uh, providing better protection have been about uh, testing and asymptomatic people, but was there not a, a risk analysis uh, done at the start of this process? That's really a matter for DHSC. I mean, it's not a scientific but, question. Well, why? Well, we, we, we flagged up that care home, well, they run, they have the accountability for that sector. And so, again, it's it, it, SAGE is not the organisation that manages these things. We can give science advice. The I, science I'm not advice asking a management gave. question, Sir Patrick. I'm asking a question about understanding uh, what uh, the risk might be. That's a data question. It's a question about understanding what potential damage might be done. Oh, to sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant risk assessment of care homes in terms of the, you know, literally going into a risk assessment, which is... No, I wasn't and, individually. Yeah. No, I, I was talking... About, to, about. Professor Ferguson told us, again, right at the start of this process, uh, that care homes weren't part of his models. Right. They didn't go down to that level of granularity. What I'm asking you, given that it was known, uh, and amongst advisors, that this would be catastrophic, and we've yeah. had 25,000 deaths, why wasn't a general risk analysis done so that policy options could be put forward to say what would be the best way of ameliorating this risk? Well, I think, I think there were, I mean, on the first point about models, the reason they're not in the models is they didn't have the data. So the data were not available from care homes to put into models. And that comes back to my general point about data, because you can't model something if you haven't got the data. And then in terms of was risk um, identified, risk was identified, and there are papers showing the risks, the sorts of risks, and again it comes back to some basic principles such as um, people working between care homes as a risk. 
imported cases are a risk, spread within care homes are a risk. So those principles of risks were um, described and, um, and therefore those are things that need to be taken into account. And you can see this was clearly the case, by the way, right the way across Europe. But there were no policy decisions. There was, there was no action taken, was there? I mean, what were the recommendations? We know there was a risk. We were told very, if, if the uh, virus got into care homes, there were likely to be very many deaths. But there seemed to be no process between knowing that basic fact and people on SAGE and scientific advisors saying, right, if that happens, what policy options are we going to recommend to government? We don't recommend policy options. Well, I don't want to fence about words, but what well, advice we can give to, to well, government? Well, I've just listed some of the advice we gave, and I think how that is utilised is, is not a responsibility of SAGE. Now, we give the advice, the advice is laid out clearly, the advice is in the public domain. People can see the advice that we've given in these matters. And then it's a matter of operationalising it. And that clearly is not a, an accountability of SAGE. Right, I'll, I'll move on. I'm not totally sure I, I completely understand that. If I can ask uh, the question that Greg asked in a sort of blunter way. Everybody has been clear that... Uh, the decisions that were taken would damage people's health because of the withdrawal of health services and of the economic damage uh, that was done. That was going to, again, did you, as the government's chief scientific advisor, recommend that there should be a paper that tried to quantify that across? Uh, different areas because basically when the decisions were being taken you were deciding that people who had onset cancer, people who needed transplants were going to die. I mean it's as simple as blunt as that. Did you say that we should try to model this and work out the numbers? Um, we have we definitely flagged that the economic risks to health were significant and CMO flagged that on numerous occasions and that was well understood by Treasury and we have pulled together groups of economists and epidemiological economists to talk about uh, measures for um, preventing spread which take into account both economics and, and epidemiology uh, with, with a number of meetings. Um, I don't think we ever said that somebody needs to crunch those numbers on the economic side. We did, however, ask for a piece of work on excess deaths taking into account the economic impact. So that was, that was commissioned as a piece of work for SAGE. And has it been done? Yes, it was done, yeah. yeah. Because in order for the government to make sensible decisions, I mean, it, the excess deaths at the moment look at it to be about 65,000. Uh, they need to know what the other side of that equation is. And I would have thought it was the role of scientific advisors to say, at the start, this is likely to lead to so many deaths because of direct infection, and then this is going to lead to so many deaths because the health service, or large chunks of the health service, is cut down, and poverty kills, basically, if people lose their, their jobs. Yes. And was that, up, yeah, was, so. was that quantified? Yes. There was a piece of work done on that by the National Statistician. And what were the numbers? I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the National Statistician did a piece of work on that for SAGE, and that's, uh, I think, must be in the public domain already. Right. We will find that. We won't grab it. Okay. Well, so, so again, we'll go to Aaron, and then you've got a couple of questions on I've testing. got a couple of questions on testing, but we can come back to them. We'll go to that. So Aaron Bell um, had something on uh, monitoring and surveillance, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just to talk about the current monitoring and surveillance, uh, Sir Patrick, what's the current time lag uh, in our values for the country as a whole and, and for individual regions? And to put that into an example, you know, are we already able to detect the effects of uh, the relaxations that we made on the 4th of July? A time lag for the R values that are published is roughly two to three weeks because they rely on a number of inputs 
um, including hospital admissions, ICU, deaths, and so on, which there's an obvious time lag. So the R is a lag indicator. Uh, there are ways in which you can do R which are more concurrent. So, for example, there's one particular approach um, run from another school of hydrogen and topical medicine called COMIX, which looks at contacts. So it's not looking at um, outcomes, it's looking at a contact survey, which gives you a more proximal measure of R. And um, the ONS survey, which is measuring infections, gives you, again, a more proximal measure of R. So it depends which value you're taking. The other thing I, I, I would say is that as numbers come down and are much, much lower, R becomes progressively less useful as a measure um, for the simple reason that it jumps around a lot with a few cases here or there or an outbreak, and it becomes really not a very blunt and lagging tool in which to judge effects. So in terms of communicating with the public, is overall prevalence at a given time a better measure uh, to, um, for people to understand what's going on with the, you know, the, the, the current decline and potentially the future spread of a second wave? Uh, we, think, we think prevalence, incidence, outbreak measures, um, those sorts of things are more relevant going into, the, into a lower um, overall prevalence state than R or growth rates are. And given those time lags uh, you spoke about um, and, and the alternative measures, you know, what's our best early warning signal if the, of a second wave? You know, would that be through that data um, that, that you've just spoken about? Or are we going to have a time lag before we realise that we might be in a, a second wave? No, it's, it, it, it's looking for things like increased number of positive tests um, as a proportion of total testing, sort of thing that was done in Leicester. That's exactly why um, uh, the Joint Biosecurity Centre was put in place to be able to monitor those sorts of numbers through test and trace. Um, and use a number of, I mean, what, what we recommended from SAGE was a number of different data streams should be used to look at this going forward, including that, but you could imagine other things as well, such as monitoring absenteeism rate and so on, gives you early signals as to where something's happening. But at the moment, it's based on testing. And are those data sets and data streams, are they, some of them publicly available, all of them publicly available, or is it mostly private? Uh, I think the intention is that they should be public, but again, that's that's for JBC and, and Test and Trace to comment on. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I'll turn to Catherine Fletcher next, but just on the, the R number. Um, have I got this right in that if we get to uh, a position, say we have one person infected with COVID in the country, um, and they infected five people, perhaps they're on the Isles of Scilly, the national R number would be five. Correct. Right? Um, and yet, so therefore, it's, it seems to me a poor guide to policy. What, uh, what you want to know is the prevalence, the number of people, where they are, how containable it is. Uh, why has R had this iconic, almost mythical status? Um? Well, it did early on in the epidemic because it was the right thing to measure there. And, and as you may have noticed with the language I've used at the podium several times, it's not the right thing to be using now. And um, it's been true in every country. I had an exasperated call with a colleague from Germany who was talking about how he was being asked to give R values every day and how they jump around and don't make any sense. And the latest um, bit that we've got on our website is low case numbers and or high degree of variability in transmission across the regions mean that the estimates are insufficiently robust to inform policy decisions. So we agree. Very good. Thank you. Catherine Fletcher. Hello, Sir Patrick. Um, uh, you've been at this a uh, good while now since half two, and I, I am aware that it's not limiting the quietest four months of your life, so I very much appreciate your time. Um, I was hoping to pick us up from, uh, from where we currently are to look at treatments and vaccines and to understand what SAGE's view on the likelihood is of those and what we can look forward to as additional measures apart from just transmission spread. So if I start with uh, therapeutics, is SAGE working on anything in, in the therapeutic space or is it again just receiving data and feeding that in? Can I give you um, my views and the views of other scientists who are feeding into this because there are specific task forces working on this and these are not topics which are coming to SAGE. So SAGE is not yeah. looking at the, specifically Please, at therapeutics or vaccines. So um, on therapeutics, uh, where we are uh, as of today is that we've got one antiviral which obviously has some effect which is remdesivir 
uh, which um, uh, seems to shorten hospital stay but hasn't yet shown a decrease in mortality. Um, you might expect that if that were to be used earlier, it's possible its antiviral effect would show some bigger action, but that hasn't been done yet. And then dexamethasone, which was the outcome from the recovery study, uh, which does reduce mortality in patients in hospital requiring oxygen therapy, and there you get a sort of 25% or so reduction in mortality, a very important finding which can be applied across the world. Um, there are more studies to read out, so there are studies from generally existing drugs that have been repurposed for this, and those should read out over the next few months, which may give further examples of where you can use drugs to try and reduce um, mortality. And then there are new drugs coming along. So for example, there are antiviral drugs which are now much more designed for this virus rather than the other ones which were designed for another virus and have just been tried on this one. So um, there are protease inhibitors and messenger RNA polymerase uh, um, inhibitors which are coming along which may have a bigger effect. So in the therapeutic space, a lot to be done. One of the things that we need to do in this country, um, I, I'm absolutely sure about this for winter, is to make sure that as many patients as possible are enrolled in clinical trials because that's the way we get the answer, it's the way we found out hydroxychloroquine didn't work, it's the way we found out the way that dexamethasone did. So clinical trials, very important for winter. Vaccines. May I just, I apologize yeah, for interrupting you, but I think it, it's worth actually highlighting what a remarkable effort the British public have made in participating in these trials to date and how they're contributing to science that is not only helping the British public but the world. Uh, I'm sure you'd want to put your thanks to them on record as well. Absolutely, it's brilliant. I mean, it, the recovery study had um, over, I can't remember exactly it's what amazing. the numbers are now, it's 12,000 or more pa patients oh. enrolled. It's absolutely impressive. And that's people volunteering to be in trials, which is a fantastic sacrifice to say, yes, I want to help somebody else by being in this trial. Um, that compares with, for example, the WHO Solidarity Study, which is a multinational study, which I think has currently enrolled about 6,000 people. Incredibly, six. incredibly right. impressive that what's been done mm -hmm. with the recovery. Um, vaccines, uh, there are, I think, over 100 vaccine projects across the world. Um, and there are some that are in the clinic and are leading. And the one which is um, at the front at the moment is the um, vaccine from Oxford, which is in um, phase three clinical trials in thousands of patients. Um, you know, that's a fantastic position to be in. And the UK has got itself well sorted out. And I was very involved in this at the beginning and stayed close to it in making sure we've got a wide range of vaccine options with different mechanisms, different approaches, because we don't know which one's going to win, or indeed whether more than one will win. All you can say is, and this is a bit gloomy, but it's true, the most likely thing for any single vaccine programme is it won't work. Catherine? So you need to make sure you've got enough of them in order to do it. And, and we're, I think yeah. we're in a pretty good position. Well, just let me understand very quickly, When are you making any assumptions about any one of those multivariate bets coming off in terms of the, the way the scientific advice is being structured to government? Well, the, the Vaccines Task Force, uh, which Kate Bingham leads, is, is absolutely looking at what are the options, what are the modalities, where are they in the um, proof stage, you know, where, how far advanced are they, what are the manufacturing implications of this, and how does that feed through also into vaccination policies? There's a very integrated approach to looking at the overall options and making sure that we get the chance not only to be part of testing them, but also, of course, access and application of these vaccines. Doesn't mean we're going to get a vaccine, doesn't mean we're going to get one soon, but we've got the bets covered, I think, in a very strong strategic way. Um, we're standing, giving ourselves the best chance of getting something. But our approach right now is not making an assumption that something's going to appear over the horizon. No. We know we're well placed for that, but we're planning as if we don't have it. I think our assumption is we won't have it, and then when we get it, we'll be thrilled. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Before I go to Dawn Butler, on, on vaccines, the, um, you mentioned the Oxford study is conducted by the Jenner uh, Institute, I think. Um, the director of the Jenner Institute today um, has called for challenge trials uh, to, to take place in which um, healthy young volunteers will be deliberately given coronavirus 
uh, after receiving the, the vaccine. Uh, and he said that uh, if challenge trials can safely and effectively speed the vaccine development process, then there's a formidable presumption in favour of their use, which would require a, a very compelling ethical justification to overcome. Do you, do you share that assessment? Well, cha uh, human challenge studies for vaccinology are well established. So there's nothing new in that concept. It's a well established way of testing vaccines. What are the two big challenges for this virus? Dose and rescue. So the prerequisites that you need to have to do human challenge studies are to understand what dose causes a safe infection mm -hmm. and can you rescue it if you get it wrong. And what, what's the current answer to those questions? We don't know the dose mm -hmm. and we don't yet know that remdesivir will rescue the infection. So not yet. Is so, so I think absolutely the right thing to explore mm -hmm but we're not there yet in terms of having all having the answers and we need to make sure we progress safely in terms of understand and you won't know the dose just because you can dream it up you need to find out the dose but there is a, there are ways to do that and you can test whether remdesivir could could rescue but those are the things i think which are going to be the ethical considerations that people will need to think about and work is going on to be able to answer those questions yes thank you uh, andrew griffith had i think um, a, a brief uh, question and then um, joel butler I think when you spoke to this committee previously, I was certainly left with the impression um, that therapeutics might be more proximate and more likely than a vaccine. A vaccine sort of at that point was the moonshot, therapeutics was potentially down the road. What, what else is going on in therapeutics? Well, just, just a word on vaccines, first of all. I, I think it's also important to recognise um, the chances of having a totally sterilising vaccine, i.e. one that 100% protects you from this, I think are low, much more likely that you have a vaccine that reduces the severity of illness and reduces spread a bit. So I think that's the more likely outcome on vaccines. On therapeutics, as I said, I think the, the, there's a lot going on now in two main areas, or maybe three. One is um, how you deal with the inflammatory response, yeah. which are the studies which should read out relatively soon and there are more starting there antivirals which I've mentioned two classes which are, are being pursued and there are many others as well and then potentially preventative medicines as well which are being looked at those are the three big buckets and they're all being looked at um, and you know I think it's right that the therapeutics is more proximate we've got dexamethasone we've got remdesivir um, and we'll see what comes next and, and what's the intervention sorry chair just to, just to, so I understand the work that Kate is doing on the vaccine side and I think Various witnesses have given us a good sense that almost every stone is being um, done, and Sir John Bell's leading a lot of work about how we do that. On the therapeutic side, is there an equivalent of that initiative, or is it by its nature much more? It, it's different. Various? I mean, again, just to be clear, it's Kate and the Vaccines Task Force that's leading the vaccines work. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, on that. Um, uh, on the therapeutic side, um, it is different. Because the issue with vaccines, and the reason we set up the Vaccines Task Force was because vaccines require manufacturing capability in a way that's a bit different. They have a different um, need in terms of clinical trials. Um, and um, in a way, you're more likely to end up with something that can come through different routes like academia than you are with some of the drug things. The drug things are largely in the um, area of big companies and, and um innovative SMEs and so on with um, with therapeutics. So they will come up wherever they come up. The manufacturing is a different issue. It's really about trials. So the question there is, can you get the trials right in order to be part of getting the answer? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Sir Patrick. Um, talk about vaccines actually, um, we took some evidence and it was it was really quite um, interesting to hear that we are ahead of a the game in any, any other country. Um, health literacy is absolutely vital in regards to fighting uh, coronavirus and the spread, people understanding what their role needs to be, needs to be in fighting uh, this virus. And I just wanted to know your views on a couple of things. Number one, um, ensuring that we have uh, all information translated 
into various uh, languages. That includes British Sign Language. We know there's 11 million people in the UK who are deaf and are hard of hearing. And now that face masks are compulsory, they won't be able to lip read. Yeah. And also, we understand that the UK government's uh, virus task force has 47,000 British Bangladeshi and British Bank, uh, Pakistani volunteers. And I'm just wondering your views on making sure that all of the information is provided in different languages to help the science and to help uh, combat the virus. Yeah, we, we, we've said in our behavioural science subgroups been very clear that that is absolutely essential and have gone a little bit further to say that many of these things need to be co-created with those communities. In other words, it's not the translation problem, it's actually how you get proper co-creation. And the third thing is that I think very often community leaders need to be engaged with this as well because it's not simply a sort of information, I've given it to you, it's done. It's, it's an engagement process. So we strongly agree with that. And um, the report from the Academy of Medical Sciences, I think, made a very important uh, recommendation, which is that uh, there needs to be a strong and comprehensive public information and engagement campaign in early autumn in preparation for winter. So strongly agree with your point. And the, the face mask Thank people you. being able to lip read when face masks are, are, are widespread? Well, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, it clearly is a big, big, you know, one of the many big issues. There are others as well. So for example, um, uh, I've had colleagues, um, respiratory physician colleagues, who've, who, who've spoken to me to say that their patients who've got chronic cough for other reason find themselves being um, stared at and, and um, shunted out of shops and things because um, people think they should be at home isolating whereas they've got a reason to have a chronic cough. So I think there are some quite important things to look at here in terms of, of how we deal with all of these areas and how we make sure that we don't end up with people being selectively disadvantaged. Indeed. And it, it, you know, it's, it's striking and incredibly depressing that this virus has not only exposed inequalities, but it has exaggerated inequalities. And that is a very important thing for us to keep in mind in everything we do. Absolutely. Dawn. Um, and just one practical question. Um, mobile testing units, should we not have mobile testing units at large workplaces where there are, say, a thousand people or so, or 500 people? Would, not, would that not help um, in regards to understanding the virus and how it spreads. And if you take Parliament, for instance, we do have an issue with potentially creating super spreaders. And so having a mobile testing unit in um, Parliament, even if it's just an ad hoc basis, will help, uh, will help you in tracking and tracing uh, if there is an outbreak of virus. So I'm in favour of, of, of testing in, in occupational settings, as I said earlier. I think there are occupational settings that do um, benefit from testing. And um, we have also um, asked for a piece of work to be done um, looking at transmission in different environments. Uh, by It's going to be led out of um, health and safety executive, but, but with academics involved as well. because. One of the surprising unknowns, and it may, it is we don't really understand the roots of transmission of this virus, as I said, and so we've got to do much more work to do that. And occupational settings are a good place to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank uh, I think Graham Strong had a couple of questions on testing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sir Patrick, for this afternoon. You've drawn the short straw, getting twice as long as you were. Yes. <laughs> but it's, it's <laughs> been it's been very very interesting. You can just. I've got a couple of questions on testing, but you just said something about a major public information campaign this autumn, which I, I think is important. Do you think that should also uh, include a major campaign on uh, flu vaccination? Because if we get a major flu outbreak, it will make things worse. And similarly, uh, or along the same lines, do you think there should be an intense intensified campaign to get the lifelong uh, pneumonia vaccinations uh, which are given to the over 65s uh, which may help uh, with this and sorry this is a long question it didn't mean to be and should we intensify the pressure on care homes to make sure their staff are vaccinated for flu? Uh, 
Um, sorry. Well, they, they, they are. I mean, we, 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 we're going to sort of agree to differ on operational points, but these are important questions. And um, on the uh, flu vaccines, um, we flagged up a long time ago that this needed to be um, a big flu vaccine season. DHSC understood that and have, um, I think, taken steps to procure vaccines. You don't procure vaccines now for winter. You procure it several months ago. Yeah. So this was something on our radar right at the beginning to say flu vaccination this year is particularly important. Um, when did you start uh, vaccinating people? No, not now. No, it's later later in the year. When? But you need to September, make, you need to put the order in Absolutely. now in order to do but it. When so does it's that a normal flu vaccine um, vaccine. I can't remember exactly when the program starts. It's sort of autumn time, late autumn that the vaccine late autumn. program starts. Um, so um, so that that I think is understood. And the Joint Committee on Vaccination um, has given advice on um, what the vaccine group should be, who should be vaccinated. Um, and um, and they've looked at the, looked at the whole breadth of vaccination. So I think that is covered, um, uh, and you're right to raise it. It's very important. Thank you. Obviously, just going to testing for um, this particular virus, the virus has to be done a sufficient number, and it has to be accurate and of sufficient quality. Do you believe that the polymerase chain reaction tests are good enough? Uh, well, well P PCR is is um, is very accurate, um, no question about that. But that doesn't mean the test is very accurate. So what do I what do I mean by that? Um, um, we know that you get false negatives, and those false negatives can be quite high at certain times of the infection process. So there are three main reasons for false negatives. One is it's early in the infection and the person isn't shedding enough virus to be detected. The second is um, that the swab itself hasn't been done adequately. And the third is the PCRs are false negative for some reason. And of those, the PCR false negative is by far the lowest. I mean, you know, that test is pretty sensitive and pretty good. So it's really swabs and um, timing which are really important. And you can see you know, if you get, if you do it at the wrong time, so if you test somebody, um, you know, after a few few days you, you, after they were infected, before they, for say, say day two or day three, you, you, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but it's a sort of thirty percent or so false negative at that point. That's very high. But it's but it's not it's not the PCR, um, there, and then there, the the other thing that's quite exciting is is. Um, new technologies coming along, so-called LAMP technology, which allows um, a, a much faster and, and easier test, which is essentially measuring the same thing as, as in PCR. Um, and I know there are studies going on at the moment to see if you can pick that up from saliva, which would make things much easier than, than the swab. Well, we need extra capacity in the autumn when yeah. children go back to school and the weather changes. Yeah. Can you put a figure on it? Um, well, um, I, I don't know exactly what the figure is, but, but, but we need to continue to ramp up testing. I mean, it's, I can't remember where we are at the moment. It's, it's, I don't know exactly what the numbers are. It's, um, I think, you know, at least 200,000 a day, I think, and it, it needs, it's going to go up higher than that. So it needs to be, we need very high level testing, and that's why something like lamp and saliva would be really good. If it was very easy and you could do it quickly, you know, you can then really think about much more widespread testing. Right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Grim. So just on that, you mentioned, uh, Patrick, the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, report, uh, and that made the point that as we get into the winter, people are going to be presenting with symptoms that may be COVID or there yeah. may be um, the f uh, other types of, uh, it might be flu, uh, and therefore need to be tested. Um, at the, and they put a figure of, I think, over 350,000 people uh, a day yep. uh, being required to be tested. Uh, have you made an assessment of whether we've got the capacity to meet that? Uh, well, we haven't got the capacity to meet it at the moment. We haven't? At the moment, no. no. Um, have you seen a plan to, I, to develop it in a I believe way? that plan is being developed. Because otherwise we're back yep. to where we yeah, were no, in it, March. It, it's essential. And um, it, and the other, the other question on this is whether you can what's called multiplex testing. So whether you could do something to test for multiple respiratory viruses at the yes. same time, which would then allow you to say, you've got flu, 
you've got flu plus COVID, you've just got COVID, and triage much more effectively. And again, this comes back to the economic point, which is um, the, there's a very big risk with multiple respiratory viruses circulating that you end up isolating a lot of people who haven't got COVID. And because of the false negative point that we've just discussed, just because you're negative doesn't mean you haven't got it. So I, that's why isolation is important. So multiplex testing, where you can also get a positive on, yes, that's flu, I think becomes quite an important part of this. I said right at the beginning of our session that part of the point of asking these questions is to be able to learn lessons that inform decisions on the way. And this seems to me a classic case of this. You know, The one thing that we've learned is that we didn't have enough testing capacity early on, so it needed to be rationed, it needed to be uh, confined to hospitals in the first place. So we, uh, this seems to be a matter of consensus now. So we must learn that lesson and apply it to make sure we have more than enough testing capacity in time for the autumn and winter, must we not? Do, do, I completely do, agree. And do you think that is, com that is fully understood and being acted on? Well, it, it's fully understood and, and it needs to be acted on. Okay. Um, and, and again, you know, it's, as an advisor and as Sage, I can't make that happen. Um, but, but I think it's important that it does happen. I believe it is happening. Um, I recognise that that is a crucial thing to do. I've talked to you about multiplex testing as well as another thing. I've talked to you about the LAMP uh, approach to try and get a more widespread testing. Um, I don't think anyone's in any doubt that getting the testing right is important. And it's a fundamental reason why funding organisations like PHE and JBC is crucial. And if you look at the countries that learnt the lesson of MERS in 2015, they funded those systems well. And other countries around the world that saw what had happened funded those systems well. So the funding of our public health system is a very important part of preparation, not only for this, but for future problems. And the responsibility of that, as you made clear during this hearing, is with the with NHS England and the Department of Health and Social Care, and we'll have the Secretary of State and the Home Secretary next week, and we'll be sure to ask uh, about that. Uh, but my uh, the final and related question is that uh, early in the, the pandemic, the committee took evidence uh, about the, the projections, the modelling projections as to the number of cases that we would have, and obviously one of the pivotal judgments was whether NHS capacity would be, uh, would be uh, swapped, uh, whether it would be exhausted. Have SAGE made that same assessment uh, of where we are for the coming winter? Um, well, the, as you know, the Academy of Medical Sciences report, which we commissioned, has done that, and it's made some assumptions around that, and we're in the middle of doing further work on that at the moment. The one thing I'd say about the Academy of Medical Sciences report is they made an assumption that R would be 1.7, just mm -hmm. as a sort of modelling assumption. And of course, that is literally just an assumption. So we're going to go through and work and see, uh, make sure that we've got that ready um, for... We read in the newspapers this morning that um, there is uh, investment to be put into the Nightingale hospitals. Uh, are we to infer from that that the, the, the normal capacity of the NHS is not going to be sufficient? So we need to be... We can expect a caseload that is in excess of that standing capacity? Well, I think it's reasonable to assume that, that you need... I mean, to be resilient, it's sensible to have that. Um, we don't have any um, prediction at the moment as to what the numbers are. And, of course, um, there, are, there are other catch-up things that the NHS is dealing with as well. So I think, again, those are really questions for the NHS, but, I mean, it seems to me entirely sensible to think about resilience in the system. Absolutely. Thank you. And it's been very helpful to understand the... The, where SAGE can give advice and where it is uh, not appropriate. So uh, to give a, f a final example of this, is it, does SAGE give advice on, for example, whether it's safer to be in an aeroplane than a theatre? We would not give that sort of comparative advice. What we would do is um, give advice on the principles of environments and how one should do a risk assessment in environments. It may be then health and safety executive or somebody would be able to take that down to the exact level of this environment versus that environment. What we have done, though, is a piece that we've asked for is, is it possible to measure COVID security in an environment, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to do? So we are looking at what the um, 
true assessment of that might look like, and I'm not optimistic you'd come up with a very concrete answer. Sir Patrick, you've been very generous with your time. We're very grateful. Um, I want to reiterate what I said at the outset. Our purpose in this inquiry is to, to try to draw lessons that can be of value during the, the pandemic uh, and beyond. Uh, the, the way that science proceeds um, and your, uh, your eminent colleagues um, practice this all the time is to ask some difficult questions um, and, to, uh, and to produce some answers that may require a change uh, of practice. Right from the outset you've um, participated in that spirit. Very grateful for your continued engagement with the committee and for the uh, very important work that you do uh, on behalf of the country uh, with those of your colleagues. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That concludes the meeting of the committee. Order, order. Committee.